On a chilly Easter Sunday in 1939, Marian Anderson was invited to sing before a hushed and reverential crowd of 75,000 people in front of the Lincoln Memorial in our nation's capital, while hundreds of thousands more listened on the radio. This electrifying event was a watershed moment in civil rights history, bringing national attention to the country's color barrier as no other event had previously done. And Anderson's final song that day was composed by Little Rock native Florence B. Price. This was not the only brush with greatness for Florence Price. As a child, her parents welcomed Frederick Douglass into their home. As a young mother, Florence corresponded with W.E.B. Du Bois, and later still, she collaborated with writers Langston Hughes, James Wright, and dancer Catherine Dunham. But the pinnacle of her life's work as a musician and composer must have been that night in 1933 when the world-famous Chicago Symphony, consisting entirely of white men, premiered her Symphony in E minor at the Chicago World's Fair. Even today, this would be a huge achievement for any composer, but at that time, it was entirely without precedent that music written by an African-American woman would be presented by such a prestigious orchestra in such a prestigious setting. The poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar used the metaphor of a caged bird for the oppression of black Americans. This is the story of a woman who refused to accept the limited aspirations that were expected of her race and gender who would not be a caged bird. This is the story of Florence B. Price. When Florence was a child, Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist, author, and orator, stayed at the Smith home while speaking in Little Rock. A reporter for the Arkansas Gazette attended a reception for Douglas at the Smith home and was quite impressed, but also quite condescending. While in Little Rock, Mr. Fred Douglas has been the guest of Dr. J. H. Smith, a dentist, residing on Broadway between 7th and 8th Streets. Dr. Smith is a colored man, but with so complete a polish in manners, dress, language, and appearance that he may be truly called a Negro in name only. As a child, Florence was both a musical and intellectual prodigy. She performed publicly on the piano at age four. She began her music lessons with her mother. But before long, they sent their talented daughter to Little Rock's Sisters of Mercy Convent School to continue her musical training. Little Rock was also the childhood home of William Grant Still, Two of the great black composers came from Little Rock, Arkansas, and I was so struck by that. What was it that caused these two people to be here at that time and to uh, evolve into nationally and even internationally recognized composers? The Smith family and the Still family lived near each other and were part of the same social circle. Our group was well-educated, lived in comfortable homes, usually in racially mixed neighborhoods, travel extensively and entertain regularly. William Grant Still. As children, both Florence Smith and William Grant Still were taught by a remarkable woman, Charlotte Stevens. And Charlotte Stevens went on to become probably the greatest black educator Arkansas has ever produced. She was in the classroom for 70 years. Charlotte Stevens was a remarkable woman with a remarkable life. And part of that amazing nature of her life was that she educated so many people of renown in Little Rock, two of them being William Grant Still and Florence Price. Sing and pray and 
by Florence's fourth birthday, race relations in Little Rock began to deteriorate. Symbolic of this change, the Arkansas State Legislature voted in 1891 to remove the portrait of George Washington that had hung in their chamber for decades and replaced it with one of Jefferson Davis, the former president of the Confederacy. Uh, Jim Crow referred to the situation of blacks who were being segregated by law. It included terror, uh, discrimination, lynching. It was much more than mere segregation. It was much more than using the term Jim Crow to describe segregation. With Reconstruction and the Jim Crow laws, Dr. Smith's practice, for example, then became segregated. So he lost all the white patients he had, and he was relegated to having paid. I think he still had a lot of patients, but they were poor patients, and he often just gave his services away. Young Florence continued to excel, and not just in music. At the age of 14, Florence graduated from Little Rock's segregated Capitol Hill High School as the class valedictorian. She graduated from high school in 1902, but she was so young that she stayed home for one more year and then started looking into colleges. Though she was very talented, she was terrifically talented, she couldn't have gone to school anywhere she wanted to go. So New England Conservatory did accept African-American students, so she went, she was 16 years old. She was just one of two or three African-American students in the school. So she started out um, as an, an organ major, concert organ, and her second track was a teaching track for piano. So that made her very unusual for students to have two degrees. The New England Conservatory was, and still is, among the top music schools in the world. But even in this environment, Florence continued to stand out from her peers. She played the very last piece on the graduation recital, made up of her classmates. And if any musician will know, the person who plays first and the person who plays last on a recital are considered the best students. So you always kick off a program and wrap it up with the very, very best. And she was clearly considered above all of her, her classmates. She was chosen to play concerts on a regular basis for the director of the conservatory, George Whiteville Chadwick. And uh, at some point she must have expressed an interest in composition. And he took her uh, as one of his, one of the very few students to actually work with him on composition. Um, but she was able to get private lessons with the director of the conservatory. And that then became, of course, life changing. <laughs> Maestro Stock agreed to premiere her prize-winning symphony at the Chicago World's Fair in June of 1933. In the audience that June night were luminaries such as composer George Gershwin and future Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. So this was really a big deal. This, this garnered national attention. An African-American female composer being performed by the Chicago Symphony, this is pretty big news. No one could have sat through that program at the auditorium last week and not have felt with a sense of deep satisfaction that the race is making progress in music. There was a feeling of awe as the Chicago Symphony Orchestra swung into the beautiful, harmonious strains of a composition by a race woman. The large auditorium filled to the brim with music lovers of all races 
rang out in applause for the composer. Robert Senstack Abbott, editor, the Chicago Defender. So the press talked about everything from her lovely personality to the beautiful dress she wore and how gracious she was at the ovation at the end. The press talked about how American the piece was. The premiere of Price's Symphony in 1933 came only two years after the first performance of the Afro-American Symphony by her childhood friend, William Grant Still. Florence Price kept on composing music at a remarkable pace throughout the 1940s. She continued writing songs, there are over a hundred of them, all total, and a lot of orchestral music, so a couple of violin concertos and four symphonies, orchestral suites, uh, some of the orchestral suites were performed by WPA bands and orchestras, and so this music dates all the way through to about 1950. On a personal side, she was in and out of the hospital quite a bit. She was often sick, but she just kept going. Um, but she, you know, she was interrupted or her work was interrupted um, by short stays in the hospital. Today, Florence Price's musical legacy lives on. Chicago-based composer Regina Bayaki is one composer who has walked through the doors that Florence Price opened. Those are the shoulders that I've been standing on. Those are the footprints that I've been walking in because had it not been for Florence Price having a piece performed by Chicago Symphony Orchestra, I'm sure they wouldn't have looked at my piece because a lot of people just don't know that black women write music like that. Her refusal to accept the limited aspirations that our culture forced on African-American women led to Price's emergence as the first important female composer of her race. During a period in our history that was a low point for race relations and gender roles, Florence B. Price was a true pioneer. <laughs> 